Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening session. Today there was a meeting for at McMaster University for something called PACPIC. And it's something about an inclusive community, sort of in response to racism, bigotry, and fear and discomfort in the community, people feeling excluded or threatened or disregarded. Because even here in Canada, we have bullies, we have We have the arising of views. See, in Buddhism, we don't really talk about people, right? When we get right down to it, it's not about people being bullies. It's about the arising of views, and they can be contagious. So they might arise in this person, and they might arise in that person, and they're contagious. And they require breeding grounds, so they require con supportive conditions. Really, if you look at po problems, even societal problems, political problems, from a phenomenological point of view, an experiential point of view, It's not so difficult to understand how they form. They're not as complicated as we think, or as mysterious, as unknowable and unsolvable, as hopelessly complex as we often, as they appear, you know, you'll just suddenly see uh, an onslaught of violence or bigotry. You'll see changes, trends in this direction or that direction. And you wonder where they're coming from. Some people will cite all sorts of socioeconomic issues that are catalysts for this. So we can find much simpler reasons if we look at what's really going on in, in, in the minds of individuals. We understand how it's not just one person. Our view is not isolated to an individual uh, to the extent that you can say, well, that's just one person. It's infectious. And yes, there are socioeconomic, political, environmental issues that, that, that help or hinder the formation of these views and emotions and attachments, addictions, aversions, and so on. But the root, the root cause is the mind. And so even the work that we have to do is not that difficult to understand. I got last night we screened a documentary and I had a little bit of a disagreement with the director not in not um uh, not purposefully I suggested something about because her film was quite 
um, gentle. It was about the prison system in America, but it was quite gentle. It didn't actually go into the prisons, and it dealt more with people, and just letting people talk and watching how people lived and the things they said about the prisons. And I suggested whether that's um, a valid way of, uh, sort of with the suggestion that changing, transforming energies, this idea of rather than engaging directly with the enemy or the problem or those people who are problems, right, rather than engaging and opposing and protesting, whether there's uh, another way. And I mentioned how we can see we can see a hint of the problem with protest. It's, it's somewhat clear, I think, these days with this much talked about election in America. And there was so much opposition to the man who's going to be the president so much hatred towards him and people would say justified hatred but anger maybe they wouldn't say hatred but they'd say anger vilification you know exposition ex exposing of his faults uh, repeating his flaws re repeating all the bad things about him, and yet he still won, right? There was an intense opposition to this man. And so there's certainly other reasons for that, but it certainly didn't make him go away, <laughs> right? People don't crawl back into the woodwork when you vilify them. It's interesting, no? There's um one of the Jatakas, I think, and I think it's a story that has been uh, told in different cultures. Um, and I think it's just a myth, I'm not sure and where it comes from, but I think it's it's told as one of the Jatakas, or it's told by the Buddha as a story. I can't remember where it's told. Someone here probably knows it and can remind me where it's from, but up in heaven um, in the heaven of the 33 there's there's this king Saka is the king of the gods and he's just a wonderful person and he's got this beautiful throne and everyone loves him and they made him I guess this this incredible massive throne of all thrones and one day the, the angels were some angels were walking by the throne and they saw this ugliest of ugly little uh, angels or, or demons up on the throne. And they, uh, they scolded him and they said, get off, how dare you sit on that throne? That throne's not for you. And they were quite upset. And so they vilified him. And the more they spoke badly to him, the bigger he grew and the more grotesque he became until all the angels were gathered around and were trying to shame this demon and getting quite upset. And he just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, Saka, king of the angels, came. they called him over and he came over and saw. And he knew right away what sort of demon this was. And so he walked over and he put his, his robe over one shoulder, which is the... the uh, sort of a respectful gesture and then he went down on one knee and he bowed before the this demon and he said my name is Saka or I think he even said my name is Mag Magava or something he gave his his personal name and uh, and he said may you be happy and the demon shrunk <laughs> and he repeated and and he behaved in such a respectful way that the demon, um, demon eventually just disappeared. Yeah, that's one of these parables that they tell. And it's, it's curious that that should be told. It, 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 it lends sort of to this idea of 
feeding into the problem. Our opposition to something feeds it quite often. Not always, but quite often. And it's, a, it's an interesting question of when it feeds and when it doesn't. And how desire... Th I think the least we can say is that it ties into the idea that desire doesn't lead to um, success or obtaining the object of your desire. It adds something, you know, creates vigilance and a, and a desire and a, a focus on the object of the desire. But there are many other conditions that are required. And so you might say that it's not usually opposition to something that makes it grow, though sometimes it can, but it's certainly not enough. Wanting someone to go away, wanting things to change. It makes uh, so pertinent this concept, this core Buddhist concept of the three characteristics of all things. Impermanence. That uh, good things will change, bad things will change. And uncertainty in the same way. Suffering that you can't fix and make things exactly the way you want. Because without these kinds of understandings, we get the false security of, s of, of stability. And we get the, this false idea that we can fix things and that we can things are going to be all right. And such that we're shocked when things go wrong. We have this ha happily ever after mentality. I always listen to a lot of spiritual people say, um, everything happens for a reason or everything will turn out right in the end or so on. Everything's going to be all right. We lull ourselves with these pseudo-spiritual views that are, <laughs> from a Buddhist point, as a Buddhist, we're just listening and saying, no, 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 <laughs> you don't get it. There's, there's no reassurance. We're not all going to become enlightened. We're not all going to heaven. Some of us might very well go to hell and be on our way there in a handbasket. And non-self, I mean, especially non-self, this inability to control and to uh, affect the change that you want. And there's, you know, there are traditions that have a sense of this, this Christian prayer about God grant me the, sur the uh, serenity, the s serenity accept the things I can't change, the strength, the strength to accept the things I can, ch I don't know, the strength to change the things I can change, the serenity to, or the patience to bear with those I can't, and the wisdom to know the difference or something like that this sense that you can't change everything that you can't you can't always get what you want sort of a basic realization of non-self but i want to go deeper and and the the co core idea here is that there is great work that can be done and it's often not involved with wishing for certain results, but it's about understanding the way the world works. And that's what meditation is all about. You talk about meditation being only used for you know, your own freedom from suffering and in, you know, in inner, s inner peace kind of thing. But there's so much outer peace that comes from inner peace or so much outer peace external peace, like peace of your surroundings, peaceful relationships, peaceful interactions with society and so on, and peace that you bring to society and to the world through wisdom, right? So meditation isn't, isn't the practice of peace, it's the practice of wisdom, and wisdom brings peace, brings inner peace and outer peace. And so anyway, I, I didn't quite finish about this documentary. I had this idea that her documentary was this sort of peaceful way of making people, opening people's eyes to something, you know, opening our eyes to 
how we deal with problems and uh, how we how society is geared towards pretending problems don't exist and, and perhaps even uh, ignoring the problems with excessive greed you know trying to get rid of low class the low class element of society or colored uh, black you know, ab indigenous um, you know minorities you know creating laws and and systems that just put them all in jail anyway she didn't agree with me i don't uh, not entirely she she got what i was saying but wanted to be clear that she was pro activist and she said anger can be useful so i think we have a disagreement that to that extent but it's okay there's room for everybody and i i i'd be it, i'm not interested exactly in talking about activism or whether it's right or wrong I want to talk about this inner change and inner, uh, the inner workings of, of uh, change that come about from, change that comes about from the practice of meditation, let's say. And not only, but also the acts that stem from meditation through seeing things clearly it's such a simple thing but let's put it put it clearly by watching your stomach when you watch your stomach rise and fall the things you can learn from simply watching your stomach rise and fall and trying learning training to see the rising and falling just as rise and fall or anything like that You're when you feel pain or any object when you think even the sound of my voice saying hearing and hearing listening to the sound of my voice arise and cease it's quite jarring when you do that actually it's not that much fun because we have we, we want to be able to anticipate you know it it it, it forces us to um, wake up you know, it's not it's not peaceful or, or simple to try and anticipate when I'm going to talk next, what I'm going to say next. It's much more fun to just let your mind wander, leave your mind go free. But of course, we know the problems with that. Our minds are full of all sorts of bad inclinations that lead us into stress and suffering, judgment and so on. So just by watching the stomach, just by watching uh, the experiences, learning to see them as they are, the uh, the mushroom effect, you know, the what the snowball effect, what comes from that, it expands outwards incredibly. Like if you look at the Buddha, one person, the great things he did, and and think of how many people this one guy. How many lives he's changed? You think of what people like Adolf Hitler did. One person. He, they had help. They certainly had help. But they became catalysts for great change. Good, bad. Like the examination of how this works quite interesting how a person makes change I'd like to argue for a real importance for us not to focus on changing political systems is communism better than capitalism judging political uh, figures or parties but talking about views talking about emotions, talking about attachments and talking about ignorance and delusion, 
talking about impermanence, suffering, talking about non-self, ego, conceit. Because that's all it is. I mean, if you look at the environment, we're all worried about climate now, and we should be. We've come quite close to destroying our home. We're getting closer all the time, and um, I mean, not that the Earth is going to disappear, but it might become. Qu it's going to become less and less inhabitable as we go along, and the only real cause of climate change and, and the destruction of the environment is greed. I mean, there's details, but without greed, it would have never come to this. Of course, without greed, we wouldn't have any of us been born, but without the intense greed, the greed in, the, in, in society is getting worse and worse, and we're, we're more and more caught up by and obsessed with getting what we want as quickly as possible, never stopping to look, stopping to examine. So I think in the context of society, in the context of the world, even in context of the universe, with all its many realms, heavens, hells, animal realm, god realm, ghosts, demons, whatever kinds of beings there may be. There's a whole world that's going on behind the scenes, behind the people, behind the structures and establishments, behind the societies and politics and economics. There's a whole world that we rarely see, let alone investigate, study. That's going on all the time with all of us, right? We're none of us categorically different from each other. There are no enemies. The only enemies are in our hearts. And I think there's a great power there. There's a great potential for power. Not that not that I think we all have to make our lives, you know, become Gandhi or Martin Luther King or or, or Buddha. But uh, we all have energy. And it's a question of where we focus our energy. We all have commitments and karmas that we've performed that are we're now having to pay off or deal with or live with but uh, we many of us have the energy to learn about ourselves to study and then to focus on that focus our lives on that on sharing meditation practices but on also focusing on peace in every situation, when you get in an argument with someone, is it, is it more important to be right and to win the argument, or is it more important to have a peaceful relationship again with this person that has somehow escalated out of control? Which one's better? If you want political change, what do you do to change society? What sort of a society do you want? Do you want a society where all the people you choose win the elections? Or do you want a society that is peaceful? You know, In many ways, the U.S. presidential election has been a big um, diversion for people from what's most important. You know, I mean, not to say that politics doesn't have power, but it, we've given it power. And... The obviously the work that people did to try and stop evil things from happening didn't work. And as far as I can see, it's, it sounds like it's quite problematic, the outcome. Acrimony. And there is now a deep, deeper divide in society. In, in our, on our campus, people were putting up posters. Uh, 
something about why is it only racism when white people do it. So it's like white, white supremacist or white pride or something. And there's a big hubbub about, big to do about what to do about this. There are many things we can do in society, but the question is where they come from and what they're what they're for. Many things we can do in our lives. We have all sorts of choices to make in our families, in our our jobs, and our career, study, what we're going to do. The real question is why are we doing it? And it's easy to lose sight of what's most important. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that this earth isn't going to last forever. No matter what we do, it's just going to burn to a crisp in a couple of billion years. There's not much we can do to stop that. So what does that mean and how do we relate to that? What's most important? So of course I submit to you most important is the mind. Much more important than this earth. This earth is a, tem is a temporary home. And we'll always go according to our karma. If the earth is getting worse and we keep coming back again and again, it's a sign we might be on the wrong path. But whether the earth gets worse and worse place to live, it's not really relevant to us, except insofar as we're a part of the problem. We can have heaven on earth if we work for it. We can certainly have peace on earth if we work for it. It's a big if. But the great thing is that uh, one should never, as a Buddhist, should never be discouraged. And I suppose some people would disagree or, or, or argue against such an outlook. But what's most important about you? We, we meet with the people who are similar to us. We meet and we join like Saka, this angel. Why it's called the heaven of the 33 is apparently because there were 33 of them here on earth. And they did so many good things for society. The things they did, uh, always helping people. They, they had this, their, their, their society was kind of a poor, villi corrupt village that was run by this crony headman guy. And uh, they had this marketplace that was not really well run. And they had to like stamp down the grass to find a place to set up their wares and so this guy was Saka was a, a merchant and so he he went and he sort of stamped down his grass and and sort of set out a place where he could set up his wares and then he went back to uh, get it to his wagon to get whatever he was selling and by the time he came back someone had taken his spot what do you do when someone takes your spot he went and made another spot and uh, and, th and then the same thing happened but this time he was more watching, I think, to see if someone else would take it. And he was so he was happy because he said, "Okay, I've done it." And, and then he made a third spot, and he realized, "Wow, you know, I, I can I can do this for people. This is a service." And he started started from there, and he started doing all these great social works. Eventually, building up a pavilion so so they could have a mark a proper market, even when it was raining or during the rainy season. And, you know, be safe from the sun and not have to deal with tall grasses or whatever. And, uh, and you know, eventually they they became these, thir and he, with all of his friends, these 33, uh, this, this large group, of committee, I guess. Eventually they got in big trouble with the headman who, who you know, liked, you know, keeping people under his thumb and, and not having this more socialist helping each other way of, of, of living. It's much better to have people un in fear of you, right? So he thought. Uh, and so he, he, he told the king that they were, that these were uh, thieves and murderers, and the king had them killed by trampling. He had them trampled by an elephant. And so the elephant came out, and, they s and Saka said to his friends, he said, look, we got no nowhere to go because they were all tied up and tossed into this elephant's romping ground. And he said, let's send loving kindness to the elephant. And so all 33 of them practiced wishing this elephant well, and the elephant didn't dare to step on them. 
the vibes they were giving out were so strong that the elephant wouldn't step on these men. And their wives as well. Their wives got involved with it. There's an interesting story about Saka's wives. Anyway, the king made them, the, he the th these 33, sort of the committee to run the village and uh, threw the, the headman in jail or maybe killed him. I don't know. Kings were not that nice back then. Uh, but their wives got involved as well, I mean, which was a big deal because women weren't all that... Uh, they didn't actually want the women to get involved. They were quite sexist. But I think the way they phrased it was uh, they didn't want to have to deal with, you know, the sort of the sexual or the romance. They wanted to be, you know, men wanted to be away from women so they could do their good work because they thought women will distract us, something like that. Anyway, it was... If not overtly sexist, it was at least um, un unfeeling. But the women were clever, and they th they had his his wife made a found a way to get involved and to trick him. I don't remember. Maybe he helped her to trick the other men who were sexist. I think that's what it was. And uh, finally, he said, "Oh, we need a." Now there was someone. Anyway, someone helped. I don't remember the exact story. The women got involved, and everybody went to heaven. That was sort of the point to sum up the story, not to go into too much detail. The point being, they did this all from some greatness that came within without actually confronting this corrupt headman, and they ended up you know, winning the day, not just by meditating. And I think there's a point there for us as well, is that you don't have to think of us just as meditators. We meditate and then we go and live our lives as horrible people. No, we bring meditation into our lives and our whole lives become meditative, how we interact with other people. We no longer try to compete or try to correct other people, fight, protest. We think of everyone, may they be happy. We wish for everyone to be happy and we work person by person, relationship by relationship. And it's it, it's uh, contagious, right? We plant seeds in others, they their seeds grow, they change people's lives. So much comes from the mind. Manopabangamadamma. The Buddha said all dhammas, meaning all good things and bad things, come from the mind. So, therefore, it behooves us all to focus and to exert ourselves in cultivating understanding. Understanding of reality, even understanding of your stomach, <laughs> I'm telling you. It'll teach you so many lessons. It'll whip you into shape. It'll have you crying out of frustration. Can't not inability to make it do what you want. It'll teach you your whole body. Reality will teach you all you need to know. So there you go. That's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for coming out. You can go ahead, um, Edward, right? Yeah, no, I'm going to answer questions, but I'd rather you don't stay. You go keep meditating, okay? No, you should go, yeah. Thank you. Saka, Saka became a Sotapanna after he was in heaven. He, he came to ask the Buddha what we call the Sakapanha Sutta. And I believe it was during, I'm pretty sure it was during the Sakapanha Sutta, the questions of Saka, uh, that he became enlightened. It's quite a good sutta. The, the Mahasi Sayadaw wrote a book on the, an explanation or a d uh, commentary on the Sakapanha Sutta. 
When is Maitreya coming? I don't know. If you believe the suttas, we'll have to have a lifespan of a hundred, no, ten thousand years. People will live will be living to be ten thousand years before Maitreya comes. Which may not be, you know, you may think, well, that's just a myth or a legend. It may not be. You know, potential for us to live thousands of years, it's not unthinkable with just looking at science. You know. yeah, of course, today's science couldn't do it, but if we stop messing up our planet and, you know, fighting over the color of our skin of all things, you know, whether people wear this or that dress, Uh, or believe in this or that imaginary person, you know? If we got rid of all these imaginary people, imaginary friends, I'm being somewhat facetious, but if we got rid of God, I think we could do a lot more. It's not the only problem, but I'm not keen on the whole God thing. I don't think it's done as much good as... It's a good question. What do you think God has done for society? I wonder what the theists would say. What has God done for the world? What has a belief in God done for God done for society? <laughs> Sanka just spent a half an hour meditating. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Sanka is his voice off or something? Sometimes voice doesn't work. Yeah, the problem with those files, they're not all right. I've, I've looked at them and some of them aren't full and complete, but I got them from another website. So you know, if you need it, I c if, if any of those files are not complete, let me know because I have the complete files on my computer. I can upload the right ones. Yeah, you guys are all into Nyanavira. There's a whole group of you. Someone just asked me today uh, about Nyanavira. Uh, and I said, I don't, I'm not all that keen on him. I don't know that much about him, but I'm somewhat suspicious. Um, again, I don't like to talk too much, but he uh, he apparently has, I think, and not apparently, I'm pretty sure I read, he has this view of Paticca Samupada that it's only this life. And, you know, once people start saying that kind of thing, I'm, I tune out. It's a there's a big group of people who believe some for some reason that Paticca Sumupada only only relates to this life. Not that it doesn't, but only? No. Anyway, he's apparently fairly controversial. Apparently. Again, I don't know too much about him. I have a f very select group of texts that uh, I'm at all interested in. I'm quite particular with the things I read and study. It goes somewhat like this. Mahasi Sayada, besides the Tipitaka and the commentaries. Okay, so the Tipitaka, the commentaries, the Visuddhimagga, um, Mahasi Sayada, uh, Lumpo Chodok, because he has so many talks and he was just really a scholar monk, and Ajantang. Okay, that's a good way to get me to leave the group. <laughs> All right, if there aren't any other serious questions, I'm going to go for tonight. All right, have a good night, everyone.